Are you curious about what it takes to manage a list of 500 different wine labels at one of America's best restaurants? What is the most important role of a sommelier? And how is the wine industry changing when it comes to diver or diversity and inclusion? And importantly, what still needs to be done? Well, you're going to get those tips and stories this evening from our guest who joins me uh, now, but I'll introduce her in a minute. Um, if you've just joined this live stream, you are joining one of the most uh, passionate groups of wine lovers who gather every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live and YouTube to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine, like our guest. This is a recording based on um, a, a video interview we did for my podcast unreserved wine talk but this is the first time we're live streaming it so get in there in the comments i'll be here with you live let me know where you're logging in from what's in your glass what's the weather like anything you like and of course if you're here with me live please i want to hear from you and as we go along what tips and stories are you enjoying um, what questions have we answered that you might like answered get in there and uh let's have fun all right so back to our guest Tonya Pitts is a, the sommelier and wine director for One Market Restaurant in San Francisco. Wine Enthusiast Magazine just named her Sommelier of the Year. She was also recently inducted into the Hall of Femme, awarded membership in Les Dames Escoffier, added to the advisory board for the, women's, uh, for the Women in Wine's Leadership uh, Symposium, and has become an integral contributor to the Hue Society, an organization focused on increasing represent representation of black, brown, indigenous, and people of color in the wine industry. Tonya's career also includes consulting, judging wine competitions, and speaking. When she started her career uh, 30 years ago, Tonya was one of the few black women in the wine industry. Now she makes mentoring a priority for those following in her footsteps, especially those from minority groups who face similar challenges. And she joins us from her mother's home in San Francisco. <laughs> Hello, Tony. We're so glad you're here. Good morning, Natalie. How are you today? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so you're with your mom. Um, you were we, just before we hit record. You said you've uh, kind of been uh, in a pod with her since the pandemic began. Yes, I have. We actually, I don't live that far away um, from her, just a couple of blocks away, but it just made sense. I'm the oldest of six uh, children and everyone either didn't live in the Bay Area or um, they were just too busy, you know, and sure. had work and, and all sorts of things. So it just made sense. And so you are the good and dutiful daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so you have another story related uh, to your mom and the pronunciation of your first name. I'd love to hear that. So my mom, basically, I tell people when they ask, how did you come to have a Russian name? And I tell people, well, you know, my mother saw Dr. Zhivago too many times when she was pregnant with me, which is why I wound up with a Russian name. It's all Omar Sharif's fault. So. Uh, <laughs> that's a, well, that's a dishy person to, to blame, so to speak. Uh, so it's Tonya, not Tonya, Tonya. right? Mm -hmm. Tonya. Tonya. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tonya. absolutely. All right. So before, um, uh, t tell us before we dive into your wine career, a little bit more about your family. We're were meals a big part of your childhood growing oh, up? Oh, gosh, yes. My siblings, it was funny. I would sometimes make dinner on Sundays. It would be my turn. Because um, my mom was a really good cook. Um, mm -hmm. But I would sometimes make dinner on Sundays. And when I did, and my, my siblings were so angry they're like oh my god sometimes i would play classical or opera um <laughs> just for something different right um wow. there was a um kqed pbs um had a radio station in st louis where i grew up and so i would listen to a lot of the programming we would and so on sundays they would have really wonderful classical music and sometimes opera and so mm -hmm that's what I would do sometimes on Sundays, make dinner and have that on and listen to it. 
as long as they would allow me to do that. (laughs) Exactly, your siblings. Well, I'm surprised because most kids or teenagers wouldn't tune into opera. What what was it? Was it just the change of music or did did opera appeal to you? I loved and love all kinds and types of music. And I think during, especially during that phase and being a young person, so it was probably, probably 14, 15 during that time, um, art had always been a really big part of, of my life and, mm-hmm. um, and studying art, even as a, a young person, that's something that we would do on the weekends. There was a organization called CASA and they had art programs for, for children and for adults. And so there was dance and music and art. And so I would go to an art class every Saturday, and I did that for a really very long time. It's something that my mom did for all of us um, as an enrichment, if there was something that we were interested in or allowed to do that. Was was there a particular type of art? Like, was it um, painting that you were into? So painting, um, pastels, drawing. um, Mm -hmm. I sometimes tell people... I now don't paint on a regular basis with with canvas and paints, which I have all of that um, still in my home. Now I use um, a meal and a plate of food and wine to tell a story and paint a picture for someone. That's exactly what I do now. So That is your canvas. Yeah, Lovely way to it put is. it. Oh my goodness, yeah. And just while we're on this topic, how do you think, what, what's the intersection between wine, food, if you will, but especially wine and music? How do you think they oh, wow. pair together? <laughs> well, I, I do think that um, there are um, certain types of music that evoke a feeling and that will take you and transport you. I think wine is very much the same way um, as well. Um, Wine takes you on a journey. You can go anywhere in the world with a glass or a bottle of wine and it's really, really amazing. Even for me, um, I think the reason I still do what I do and why it means so much to me is that I can actually smell a glass and especially if it's something that I've experienced before and it transports me right back to that time and place Mm -hmm. when Mm -hmm. I originally had that bottle of wine. Um, It's amazing. It really is. is. You know, when you have a glass of wine and you have food and you have people around you, um, you're creating these memories, and that is what wine does. It creates memories, and it brings you right back to that time and place and that memory um, when you have that wine again. So it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. It is. It's so evocative. And, you know, the science has shown us that, you know, smell especially, even more mm. so than taste, just connects directly to emotion and memory. So, you know, you're, you're really working with the best canvas of all, um, given that sensory power of wine to take you back to a certain place. So um, was wine a big part of family meals growing up? Oh, gosh, no. You know, no? my my... My great great grandmother and um, great grandmother actually only drank kosher wine. So, uh-huh. Mogan David and Manischewitz would would be in the refrigerator, and that's what they'd have. And they'd have a mm-hmm. glass of that every day. And okay. that's how wine showed up, you know, sure. in my life um, that way. But when I when I did start working in a restaurant and was old enough to drink, I would work in really nice restaurants and my grandparents would come in and have a meal. And because my grandfather had been in World War II and been in Europe, he understood, you know, what a sommelier was and, and what wine was. And, 
And so that was really very interesting for me. And I think even as time went on and I decided to, to go down this path, um, he understood and he knew what it was, um, yeah. which was really very important um, to me because I, I loved my grandparents and my grandfather really very, very much. He's no uh. longer living, but it, it just it meant a lot because I had always thought that I was going to go to law school. I actually was in a pre-law program and changed direction, uh, decided to study art and moved to San Francisco. And that's how all of this kind of happened. Um, oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So you, you were, yeah, you wanted to, what, okay, so you're taking the art classes. Mm -hmm. That was your early in inspiration for art, but what made you move to San Francisco? Um, because I was uh, spending too much time in uh, the studio, all my time. Ah, I was spending okay. all my time in in the studio, and I talked to the the dean of the art department, and he just said, you know, you have you know studio art as a minor, but it's really taken the front seat, and you really should think about not going to law school and not continuing on that path and and doing this i mean because at that time i was thinking about going into the endowments and being a lawyer and working with with galleries is what i was going to do um but okay, as i so looked endowments at endowments are they the funds that the funds, uh, yes. Fundraising? For yes, fundraising galleries and, okay. for galleries and for okay. museums. Yes. Um, okay. and, and there is a niche for that um, for lawyers, but it's very small. Um, uh, very few women, again, um, mm -hmm. in that role. And I just thought about it. Would I really be happy? Did I really want um, to struggle um, with that because the numbers were so low? And I just thought, you know what? No. And I went to San Francisco for a, a long weekend. It was in January. It was rainy, cold, overcast, and got off the plane and was standing looking over the city on a friend of a friend's terrace and was just struck by the beauty, even in the fog, you know, even in the fog. It um, just, I just thought, oh my God, this is it. And I took that weekend and I went all over the city and just explored. And by the end of those four days, I decided I was moving and um, applied to California College of Arts and Crafts. And because I was not um, a resident of California, I had to wait a year. And so... What did I do? I got a job in restaurants, and okay. the rest is history. And that's oh, wow. exactly um, how that went. But you know, to <laughs> backstory, yeah. I had worked in restaurants while I was in college um, in St. Louis, going to St. Louis University. And um, okay. that first summer, the summer before I was going into um, freshman semester, I had always gone to the university on weekends, and so I had friends that were much older than myself, and they were all going to go work at this restaurant in the Central West End, and unbeknownst to me, the chef was a female and had lived in Provence for 10 years and had moved back to St. Louis to open a restaurant, and that was my introduction to restaurants. And um, okay, her friends. And how from, did she influence your career? Like, what what did you learn from her? Oh, and it wasn't just her; it was everyone that okay. were, that were there because her friends she, came from all over the country to help her with that project. Some stayed mm -hmm. after the summer, um, and that's where everything just kind of blossomed and unfolded. Mm -hmm. um, just having wine on the table at the end of the night and food, um, the conversations that were had about food and wine and the synergy of all of that um, was just 
really eye-opening and yeah. it just really struck me and even though I couldn't drink um, I could sit there and listen to the conversations but one day I got up enough nerve to pick up a glass swirl it and smell and talk about what was in the glass and huh. that's that's what did it no yeah, that's oh. exactly what wow. did it um, and did they have family meals at that restaurant oh yeah at the end of the night yeah. That's where all oh, of this. Oh, at the end of the night. Okay. Yes, gotcha. at the end of the night. Yeah. Um, okay. And, but even still, then, I had no idea that this is what I was going to do with my life. Um, right. Right. Even wow. today, I, I can smell forever, and um, that's my process. Okay. I smell write my notes, smell, write my notes, smell, write my notes. And then, you know, seven minutes later or so, I'll go into tasting and really? then write those notes. Um, and it's really because my process in learning, when I was much younger, um, it was just that. I was just smelling because I couldn't taste the wine because I was underage, couldn't drink. Sure. So, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So smell leads, and and you find separating those two, like smelling and then having this seven minute delay or whatever. Oh. Does that? How does that impact versus just smelling and then taking a taste, like a lot of people do? How how does that help you? Well, because wine evolves and changes in the glass, True. and so you're able to see several different layers. Um, of the yeah. wine and expressions because it's all there. Um, yes. Whereas if you do kind of a quicker pass, you miss something, right? right. That's true. Um, and you I accommodate to certain aromas and flavors. Like, so your first sniff might give you something, oh, yeah. but then if you go back, you know, you've maybe accommodated to the top layers, top notes, top aromas, but then mm -hmm. you get something different as well. Uh, you're changing and the wine's changing. Absolutely. It's taking you to a different place and a different level. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great technique. I'm going to try that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you went, you were working in the St. Louis restaurant, then you decided to move to San Francisco for art school. So which restaurant did you start working at in San Francisco when you, when you got there? Zuni Cafe was my, oh, my first job yes. um, in the city. And... Um, I tell you, I just, I really think that it was the fates. I think it was yeah. supposed to happen. Um, Sylvie Dar, who was the wine director at that time at Zuni, um, I met her. I went in and applied for a job. It was on a Monday, which they were closed on Mondays. And um, she talked to me for about an hour and a half and told me to come back the next day and told me what to wear, what to do. And that was the beginning um, of that. And I started as a server there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Sylvie realized that I was interested in wine and more interested than most. So whenever there was a tasting she would always allow me to taste wine she was she was very um supportive and kind of coaxing me out of out of that shell and kind of once i just kind of dived in i just kind of fell in head first even more so um especially being in a city as cosmopolitan as as San Francisco, um, sure. and just being opened up to more wines of the world and old world, which I'd already had quite a few of the old world wines that my palate was much more geared towards old world anyway, because of the first restaurant that I'd worked in. Um, and right. so and that, that first restaurant must have had a wide French list, did it? Oh, French, Italian, and Australian and some, some domestic wines, some California wines. Um, okay. 
as well, but they were the classics. Um, the classics all the way, you know, around. Um, once I had my first Lafitte. Um, Your first Lafitte. That's my, first a... Lafitte <laughs> my first Lafitte. My first Lafitte. Yeah. How was that? Oh, gosh. Do you remember the vintage? It was, um, it was 1976 oh, vintage. Goodness. And um, wow. yeah, it, uh, the list was crazy. And now that I, I yeah. think about it, that uh, now that I'm older and think about it, it's like, wow. And I had no idea, you know, yeah. no clue. Top growth Bordeaux. My oh, goodness. you know. Um, and even as time passed by and I would taste through vintages, that is still one of my favorites. You it benchmark, you, you remember mm. still, you yeah. have that in your library oh. of, of aromas oh. and, oh, yeah. I too. call it the Rolodex. <laughs> oh, really? Tell us more about that. What, you so, have a wine Rolodex? Oh, in yeah. In my head. Yes. Sometimes head. if I'm yeah. having a moment of recall, I have even been known to kind of do this, like oh. I'm flipping and turning, right? Um, okay. Because it is a visual. If you think about it, sure. Um, yeah. And it kind of coaxes you and brings you right front and center to that note, to that place, um, to the wine, so huh. to speak. Yeah. Um, and, that's... and for anybody who's part of Gen Z and might not be familiar with Rolodexes, <laughs> right. it used to be the way we stored business cards, youngsters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it would be on a big wheel and you would flip literally to the person you wanted to contact. But you've got this wonderful uh, mental model for your flipping in your mind to the different yep. aromas of, of different wines you've stored away. So that, that's lovely, lovely image. And, and you also in that Rolodex, you have a Ross shield, don't you? Um, no, no, no not no. that one. Um, the, no. okay. I must have it wrong. The, uh, you for your birthday, someone opened a very special, very old, um, I think it was Bordeaux. I think it was 1900. Oh yes. The Rothschilds. Okay. Oh my okay. God. It was a 1900. That's actually 1900. the oldest Holy wine Whew. that I've ever tasted. And it wow. was really, really exciting because um, the the cork was just basically just kind of disintegrating. And oh, really? we had to sift out the cork. And, but the wine just kept going and expanding. It wow. was just really lovely it um, wasn't dead it wasn't oxidized no. or over oh my wow. gosh no that's incredible no it just oh. and we actually and now i have to i have to get that out because we actually videotaped the whole process mm -hmm. and that oh. part of the evening and when we would go back to to taste we videotaped that so i actually have it saved oh. someone put it on a CD-ROM and, and gave it to me. So I need to, I need to look oh, at that, that and relive that moment. Oh yeah. my God. I mean, yeah. My gosh. That was... What did it remind you of? Like, how would you describe it today? I mean, it was still alive, still fresh, but how would you, if you were to write a tasting note about it? Um, and it was as it? though, and this is how I remember it and recall, it's that worn piece of leather mm. that would be a book, a journal mm. that you've had for many, many years and you open it and the smells that would come out, um, the kind of leather and almost this kind of organic and inorganic smells um, that would come through of earth and dust and dried fruits, plums, cassis, raspberry, um, chocolate. But then it's that, it's that flower that you've had, rose petals, 
mm-hmm. that are dry that are there as well. And that came through. It just it was it was really, really fascinating and really beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that image too of the book, the worn leather, and maybe even the yeah. pressed rose petals are in between mm-hmm. the pages. Like yeah. I just love that unfolding yeah. of that wine. Yeah. Beautiful. And how would you compare that maybe to the seventy six Lafitte? Uh, you were trying to contrast them. <laughs> that was fresher, brighter, almost kind of jumping out of the glass. I almost see that as a parade. Oh. And I don't know if it's because it's 76, right? Right. Um, Fourth of July, 1976, yep. right? Um, yeah. yeah. But just more kind of youthful, plum, red apple skin, um, bittersweet chocolate, mm. um, chicory notes like that yeah really really yeah beautiful as well i love bordeaux though yeah but i think that's because um those were some of the first wines that i experienced as a young person Mm -hmm. um you cut your teeth as a baby sommelier on bordeaux yeah Yeah, completely (laughs) but i also love older wines in general and even from anywhere in the world, um, mm-hmm. from from Washington, California, I just I I like aged wines because I really think that they they tell a story. It's as though you're experiencing you're experiencing um, history in a glass mm-hmm. in a bottle, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. and whether you were there or not it gives you kind of a, a glimpse into that moment and into that time. Sure, yeah, it does. And the aromas yeah. are interesting too. They've mm-hmm. evolved. It's kind of like people that they are having a more interesting conversation with someone or something, uh, some wine that brings more to the glass that, you know, it's not the obvious upfront fruit. It's, it's those, as you say, the leather and the, you know, the, the, the pressed rose petals, that sort of thing is. It's a much more in-depth conversation. (laughs) It is. It is, yes. (laughs) Um, Have you uh, ever dropped a bottle of wine? Accidentally, of course. Oh, I have. And thankfully, it's not been on the floor during service. Yes. I've dropped a bottle or two in the cellar. Oh. May it be the showcase cellar where all the windows are. Um, but that's been before or after hours. Um, sure. Or in the larger back cellar. That's happened before, too. Um, Do you remember what bottle? Oh, gosh. Or, it was, what, no, was it? They have not been... Um, they have not been bottles that are super expensive. Let's just say that. Thank God. It's, they've been more kind of, you know, by the glass sort of things. Or sure. if I didn't use the ladder and I was trying to stand on a box or on my tippy toes and carry too much and, and dropped something. The other yeah. thing, when that happens and the bottle just bounces, that's oh. the best. And it doesn't oh, That's break. good. <laughs> I didn't know bottles could bounce, but yay. <laughs> they can. Mine don't. <laughs> Nor do my wine glasses. They're just ah. Oh. Anyway, oh. <laughs> but yeah, it must get it must get. Uh, I mean, it's very physical what you do as well, like getting all these bottles from different heights, and then there's inventory taking where you're probably moving around a lot of stock. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. it's a physical job too, being a sommelier, isn't it? Yes, very much so. Yeah, and then moving boxes, mm. um, you know, which happens before and after service because you're getting your day started um, and set up. And then at the end of the night, you're setting up for the for the next day's service. Um, I've been very, especially within this role at this uh, at one market, since it's such a large, um, large restaurant, I've always had people um, on staff and mentored 
who want to learn about wine, who want to come in the cellar and who want to help. And so that's always been pretty fantastic. Something I used to do sometimes at the end of the night, um, if it were a, a weekend night, I'd have people come in and help in the cellar and we turn music on and I'd open a bottle or two of wine and we would put wine away and listen to music, taste the wine, talk about wine. Um, and it made it a lot more fun. Um, but you get people's attention that way and sure. the retention um, as well. But yes. that's, that was always really good. But I would do that for yeah. staff too. Yeah, yeah that's a great way, obviously, to learn about wine. There is a huge difference between reading about Burgundy or wherever Bordeaux mm -hmm. from a book and then actually tasting it. You're, you're evoking that sense memory again as you, as you taste. And even better so, I think, if you can taste while you're in the region. It's just so many layers of layer, you know, learning if you can do it that way. That is just an eye-opening experience mm -hmm. to actually go to the place and, and have the wine. Because then that brings us back to that memory because it ties everything together. And if you can be in that place, see the people, taste the food, walk through a vineyard, touch the soil, um, everything just, it's like wrapping everything up and putting it in a bow. It's like this, it's like a gift, right? Yes. Um, it's yes. a present, but it's, absolutely. it's an absolutely splendid present um, because you can come back to that time and time again and yeah. relive that yeah. moment. Um, yeah, it's true. It's a present to your future self. I love that. <laughs> that gift yeah. that keeps on giving the memory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and do you have a favorite region that you've visited that really oh. comes back to you a lot? I'm sure you've visited well, lots I, of regions, but they all are. Um, I think. The one that I come back to time and time again, there's, there's, there are several. Um, my first trip to Portugal, which just the sights, sounds, smells, because it was during, um, was that the summer? It was during the fall, and just, it was absolutely splendid because of also the history as well, the architecture, the buildings, um, and the wine and the people and the food. And then also, um, as I've gotten older, I realize that my heart is in Italy. Um, oh, really? The first Why time, so? well, the first time I, I went to uh, Piedmonte and actually went to La Mara, um, and I was standing in uh, uh, Mikhail um, Chiarolo's vineyard and looking up Famous at the maker, sky yeah. and it's as though you can touch the heavens um, and Lamara. It just, it's, it's like right there. And so to me, um, that's what the wines are like. It's, they're heavenly. Um, they're celestial, they're celestial, you know, um, and so that's my memory. Um, whenever I'm thinking of that region or tasting wines from the region, and it really does lift and heighten because I've been there, because I've been to the region and spent a little bit of time there. Just and you have an remarkable. artist's way of remembering it and talking yeah. about it, so you yeah. you bring that extra layer to those memories. Yeah. Just wonderful. Yeah. Any other wine regions stand out for you in terms of a memory <sighs> that comes back? Mm, of course, France, because sure. that's where I, I cut my teeth. Um, yes. I cut my teeth there. Um, Was there a particular well. vineyard there that you remember, uh, like the Italian? Uh, well, basically Provence, Provençal, uh, Wynn, Le Mistral. Um, just the breeze and touching your face and, and the wind and mm -hmm. the warmth and the heat and, and the smell and the rocks. Um, mm -hmm. I love rocks. 
<laughs> I, Excellent. I, I like an, <laughs> another rock nerd. Yes. Do you like smelling rocks? You can oh, admit it if you do. Yes, yes. I do. <laughs> I them do. Up and smelling them. Oh my gosh. I've been tempted to lick a few rocks, but then mm. I thought that's probably not safe. You probably shouldn't do that. But <laughs> I. But you know. But you. You have to gather the essence um, of that material. And so because wet rock and dry rock smell completely different. Um, You know, there's a there's a sensory um, smell that I have and it's fresh, um, wet soil during the rain, in the middle of the rain, and after the rain, and it all smells different. Mm -hmm. And there's fresh soil that is just beginning to dampen. That has a certain smell. Um, When it's soaked, it has a different smell. Um, And so that is a sensory smell that I do have, and there are there are some times that you do get that um, in some red wines, um, that particular earth component. Yeah, um, absolutely. And when I smell it, I actually visual, I visualize it and I see it. Okay. So, that's but that's... And would you, sure. And would you describe uh, a wine to a customer like that? I, I guess I know it would depend on how much knowledge the customer had, but are those kind of terms you would use when you're... Um, presenting a wine? Mm, sometimes, if it makes sense. Sure. Um, but as I've said many times, you have to meet people where they are and you don't want to talk over someone's head or beyond their knowledge. It all has to make sense and it has to be appealing and pleasurable for people. Um, when I take a chance on something and if I don't have exactly what someone's looking for, I will talk about something that is similar or what I think is a transferable, um, variety or bottle. Right. Right. But I'll say, if you don't like it, I'll take it away and bring something else. And for me, when you open that bottle and the guest tastes it and the light bulb and the the sparkle and the eyes, and that's just because you did it Mm -hmm. and you've turned someone onto something new, different and exciting. Um, And now they want to go out and discover more. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. um, That's magical. Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like students learning. Um, my mom was a school teacher for more than 30 years, and she just loved that moment when, the, as you say, the light bulb goes on and their face lights up and they understand and their world has been opened up another, you know, yeah. inch or two. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty, I'm sure, gratifying for you. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the reasons that I'm probably still on the floor as well as the interaction with with guests and talking about wine and most definitely the service aspect of that. I've done this for, I've done this for many decades, more than two. Mm. Um, And um, it's been really gratifying, really Mm. gratifying. It's been a a fun and lovely ride. It Mm. really, really has been. You know, I tell people, yeah, go ahead. I tell people that I didn't choose wine. Wine chose me. Right. Um, because I didn't know that this was something that I could, could do, um, or even that was available, um, sure. to me. I didn't see a lot of women. I didn't see a lot of people of color. I saw and really no people of color, um, mm-hmm. when I was coming up uh, in the industry and, and doing this and right. now here I am. And it's important to me to give people encouragement and to be supportive when they have an interest in this. And, and it's all people. 
Um, if I have someone that's a lawyer, an executive, or however, and they say, you know, gosh, I would love to have your job. You know, I've been studying, I love wine, I have a collection, you know, but when I retire or stop doing this, I would really, I would like to kind of dive in and do this. And I say to them, if it's something that you're really serious about and you have a love and a passion for it, absolutely. You know, mm. I'd be happy to, to speak with you. And I've had some people take me up on that, um, that have changed careers um, or finished a career and decided to, to go into to wine. And so it's, it's possible. You know, yeah. It's possible. Anything is possible. But you have to nurture people. And yes. because and I had... That. You're, you're really... Yeah. Uh, mentoring is very important to you, isn't it? Like you, you're involved yeah. in a number of different organizations. And then, of course, you're doing it with your own staff. Um, tell us more about that. So I've always um, been very hands-on with, um, with teaching, um, especially I, I learned a long time ago when you have a staff of people um, and a team, you can't present something and put something in front of them if they have no idea what it is or they've never experienced it. And so that's one thing I made sure that I gave people um, kind of a basis. Um, this is what Sancerre tastes like. This is what um, Bordeaux tastes like if they'd never had it before. And then we can go into, this is what I would like to put on the wine list. This is what I'd like to pour by the glass. Because if people don't have a reference, then I'm the only one that's selling it. Hmm. Right? Right. That's no yeah. fun. <laughs> um, so that's how that started. Um, but just with people, as I said, if people have an interest, why not, you know, mm -hmm. help them and mentor them? Because I had several people that did the same thing for me. And so I'm yes. passing that, definitely, you know, passing that along. Um, during the pandemic, as the pandemic was starting, I was actually approached by Martin Reyes, um, Master of Wine, about a new project that they had him and um, Mary Margaret Mechanic and Dylan Proctor, and it was called Wine Unify, and mm -hmm. nonprofit that would actually help uh, individuals that were thinking of getting into um, the wine industry, whether it would be as a, a sommelier or um, within distribution, but giving them the tools that they would need, um, the wine, the glassware, the access to classes, um, and a, a mentor. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. And so that's how um, that started. And then, of course, there was Badenage Forum, um, a women's organization, um, which basically focuses on all aspects of, of wine and having females involved in all of that and kind of as a support system for those of us that were in the industry. Um, and a mentorship program actually has started for Badenage Forum um, as well. And those are, are all, um, there's uh, sales, there's marketing, um, there's hospitality, um, there's writing, and they all have mentors within those um, categories and they have mentees. And so mm -hmm. that's another. Um, there's also the United Sommeliers Foundation, which was started during the pandemic by Christy Norman um, and Master Sommelier Chris Blanchard um, for support for sommeliers 
during the pandemic and just during crisis. And so that's financial help. So I'm on that board. Um, and How do you do all this, by the way? <laughs> My goodness. And well, a full-time job. And <laughs> when you're on a board, it doesn't take all of your time, but it takes, okay. you know, four or five hours a month at the most. Okay. So um, but it's all it. really, yeah. it's important work, though. Yes, you know? it is. Very. Um, I mean, it's yeah. very admirable. Yeah. yeah, it's it's all very, very um, important work. And, and then also the work that I do with um, the Hugh Society, um, Tahira Habibi and the Roots Fund, Carlton um, McCoy and Akimi Dubois. Um, it just, they're all things that need, that need to happen. Lift sure. Collective as well. You know, if I have time and I can do it, I do it. Wow. And it's not all of the time. It all kind of comes and goes in cycles. Yes. Um, yeah. But Seasonal. during during the pandemic, there was, was more time um, because mm -hmm. our lifestyle and how we had done things basically became virtual. Yeah. And things just shifted. Um, sure. But and it became more of that. how does the Hue Society that. differ from some of the other groups? I'm curious about that. Um, the Hue Society is made up of, of people of, of all, um, of black and brown people as well. But what you'll find in the Hue Society, there are people who are just enthusiasts um, that may want to um, become involved in wine as well. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely, it's community um, oriented. And they're in all cities now. And they're also, also abroad now. They also have a chapter in South Africa um, yeah. as well. Um, and that's a whole nother, whole nother story. Yeah, I went to South Africa recently uh, during the summer, and that was another eye-opening experience um, as Beautiful well. Beautiful wine taste region the there. Wine. Oh yeah. my gosh, Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch. Oh. Yeah. One yeah. of the most beautiful countries and one of the most beautiful wine regions. I've, yeah. I've probably the most beautiful wine region I've ever visited. Yeah. I mean, just so beautiful. They're all Breathtaking. farms. And, yeah. And yeah. the rolling hills. and Yeah. And so when you started, there, as you said, there weren't a lot of... Um, uh, people of color mm. in the wine industry. So no. uh, what's happening now? You you do so much advocacy. You are a role model. What are the important things that have changed in the wine industry and what still needs to be done? Well, I I think that in light of the pandemic and, and George Floyd, there was more of a light that was kind of shined on everything. But... Mm -hmm. We were and are um, a kaleidoscope of people who are all over the world, and it's always been that way. But I think within that community of people that are in wine and in food, we all started to connect more with one another, um, connecting with someone that lived in Morocco or connecting with someone that lived in Italy or in France or that was working and living in Chicago. Um, we were all trying to connect with one another. And Julia Cooney actually created Black Wine Professionals, which was also basically a network that listed people that were in the industry um, so that we could all find each other. Um, but also if someone wanted to work with any of us, they could find us and have all our information there. Sure. Um, That's great. There's also well, that as well. But, you know, I created Women in Wine while I was um, working at One Market. And it was basically to shine more of a light on women winemakers in uh, the wine industry, which is a very small amount. Um, we're probably at about 12% um, now uh, that are assistants or 
um, winemakers um, at a winery. Um, and it's growing, um, but it's something that I wanted to shine a light on because we're just not known, right? Um, yeah. and, and that was the beginning, beginning of that. Um, and it's just, it's difficult, but it's not just wine. You could go to so many different professions yes. and it's the same, right? It just so happens that I work in wine. Yeah. So that's my focus. <laughs> Absolutely. Bloom where you're planted. I mean, you can mm -hmm. make the biggest change from yep. within. Um, that's yep. fantastic. So we need more representation. What what are what are things that we can do? Um, those who are listening, whether they're inside the wine industry or not, they're just wine enthusiasts. What are what are some things we can do to help advocate for that? Help move things ahead. Seek out wines that are produced by women, LGBTQ, um, and people of color, and yes. experience them. Um, and support them in their endeavors. Support meaning buy the product, go to right. their tasting rooms, go to their wine festivals and events. You will be pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. um, so much wine out there. So many really fantastic, beautiful wines from all over, all over the world, all over the United States. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Virginia is also gaining um, within their community and, and wine region um, of growing um, and producing wine. But, you know, we make wine in probably 54 of uh, the states mm -hmm. in the United States, and they all have communities and they've always made wine um, and because it's such a global economy um, with wine yes. I think now that people are really taking it much more seriously that live in different states um, mm -hmm. and if they have a passion and a drive and they can do it they're doing it you know yeah. Yeah, I, uh, and people learned to order online, and they started experimenting with different wines from different regions during the pandemic. I mean, we just, I think consumers became more educated about their choices as well. Most definitely, and I call yeah. it the discovery phase, and we are okay. still in the discovery phase. I think people are much more um, open to trying something new and different, whatever it is within beverages. Um, sure. even if it's, you know, spirits, beer, ciders, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. And the explosion that's starting to happen now with non-alcoholic beverages mm -hmm. as well, yes. um, is really very, um, interesting. I tasted, um, blind, a, a non-alcoholic rosé a couple of weeks ago, and it was delicious was wow. really, 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 really good. And Could so, you tell that it had no alcohol? Like if you had tasted it and not known, d d is it apparent that it doesn't have alcohol? No, because huh. it was the flavor profiles that you would expect wow. from a, from a rosé that was produced with Grenache because it's all about the grape, right? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it was, and do you it was offer really non-alcoholic wines on your list? No. No, okay. Is no. that coming maybe? Or would that be something you ever con consider in the future? No, probably not. No, okay. no probably <laughs> not. Although, but I'm, I'm definitely interested in non-alcoholic options, um, sure. which we, we do have and we do offer. Um, and I actually want to um, explore Proxies, which is a new uh, product that's made from wine and made from teas. Um, you can have them on their own or um, you can use them as mixers as well to create beverages. And so 
So if you have it, interesting. people, proxies. Okay, yeah. proxies. We'll put that, mm -hmm. a link to that in the show notes, along yeah. with all the organizations you mentioned earlier. Definitely would love to list those out so people can find those organizations and support them. Um, all this talk about wine is making me thirsty. I don't want to forget <laughs> to taste wine with you, Tonya. So what, which wines do you have with you there? So um, two wines. And okay. I, I love wine. Um, for me, it definitely is a feeling and a moment um, of what I'm drinking. Mm -hmm. If people ask me, what do you normally have in a glass? And I say, well, think of it as if you're ending the night or the day with a beer. Mm -hmm. For me, it would either be sparkling champagne mm -hmm. or white wine because I kind of see it as a palate cleanser and kind of as something refreshing. Yes. So I have some white wine this morning. Um, so uh, Chateau du Chamaray, which is a uh, Grand Vin de Bourgogne um, from Mercure. Oh, there's the bottle. Mercury, yeah. yeah. And we'll link to that in the show notes, yes. Will and be a Chardonnay um, based? It's a Chardonnay based. And yeah. this is really interesting because they're pulling from eight different plots uh, in the vineyard and blending uh, the Chardonnay there. Mm -hmm. Um, huh. and, uh, when we were talking okay. about, you know, just sight and soil and, mm -hmm. you know, I put my nose in this and the first thing that, you know, I get are these nuances of, of rock and shale and, uh, chalk, but then the fruit comes through and yellow apple, pear, um, lemon, saline. Um, yeah, it's just super, 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 super fresh, bright, very, very lifted. You're making my mouth water describe. Yeah. <laughs> if I were just, I would want something I would want oysters with this I would want a seafood pasta mm. even um, truffles Ooh. Mm. white truffles mm. Lovely. I love the way you're nosing it to get the suggestion from the wine itself to tell you what to pair with it mm. <laughs> the wine is talking to you <laughs> and that's delicious and for the for our first sip of the day that's perfect. Yeah. Um, right in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Palette. And um, the other, uh, Paggio Altisuro Solo Sol, um, Toscana, it's a Vermentino. Okay. Oh, And it's oh, lovely. another young and fresh. Um, okay. What I like about this wine, and it's a screw cap, hmm. um, is that and I love Vermentino, mm -hmm. what but is it I like love about it yeah. because it higher, um, higher acidity, super super fresh, bright, lifted. Yeah. Well, you see, that's a it's a pattern. Um, sure. I, that's but that's what I like to just kind of wake my palate up, but also. I think it's great for pairing with foods as well, because mm -hmm. you could have this with salad, you could have it with pasta, you could have it with poultry, um, chicken, and you could have it with, um, with duck, with quail, um, vegetables, anything. But this is a little bit weightier in the middle of the palate. Okay. Mm. And again, you've got that, that earth and that rock and that soil. But this is kind of, when I was talking about earth before, when I was talking about wet, wet soil, this is dry. Huh. And it's kind of powdery. Um, okay. Interesting. Yeah. When I think yeah. of the earth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. 
Under the Tuscan sun, no doubt. Oh, <laughs> it's nice no. and dry powdery. <laughs> but in this nose, kumquat, blood orange, um, some pink grapefruit uh, comes mm. through, and it's the skins and the zest um, that I'm smelling. Um, mm. oh, but it's weighty. <laughs> But it's not, it's not so heavy that it will overtake or overpower a meal. Both of these wines would complement a dish, which is what you want wine to be anyway. Sure. Um, I think wine and food definitely go together. Oh, yeah. You don't always have to have food with wine. There are no. those moments. More um, wine with more wine, yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, when this anybody is really asks pretty. me for my favorite pairing, that's what I tell them. <laughs> um, but yeah, especially mm. these vibrant whites that get you salivating, because as you know, like it's it's literally the saliva that whets our appetite, but also is going to spread the flavor mm. of both the wine and the food out. It's going to touch and stimulate more taste buds the more our mouth waters. So, and that's what those zesty whites do with some acidity. Right now, this has higher acid than the uh, Chardonnay, huh. and and I'm completely salivating with this yes. one. But yeah. I, that earth that I was talking about, there's mm -hmm. this big stone that's in the middle of my palate huh. that's mixed with with all of the the fruit that's there. I love but that. I can envision a big stone sinking into wet sand and just kind mm. of falling away. Um, and there are some wines that I will taste, particularly white wines, and that's the vision that comes when I'm tasting those wines. So yeah. I'm like a true artist again, the very visual, that layering, yeah. of, uh, the way yeah. you experience wine. Wow, so cool. Oh my goodness, I can't believe how, oh, you're, <laughs> I can't believe how quickly this is going, Antonia. I, I want to ask you a few more questions. Continue to enjoy your wine there. Um, but uh, a few more things because I, I want to, I, I'm dying to know what you think. Is, um, is there anything you believe about wine which, with which some people might disagree? Some people say that terroir is not true mm -hmm. and there really is a sense of place um, for everything that's grown um, there are markers there are definitely um, nuances that are tied to a place anywhere in the world mm -hmm. um, the other is when people say I don't know how to taste wine. I can't discern the flavor profiles that are there. I mean, I just, I don't know. The first thing I tell them is pay attention to what you are smelling anywhere. When you go into the market, into produce, start smelling herbs, start smelling the flowers, because it's basically that Rolodex that we were talking about. It's yes. all sensory memory. Yes. Um, and to have confidence because nine times out of 10, when you put your nose in that glass, the first thing that comes to your mind is the correct thought of what's in that glass because it's mm -hmm. really something personal. It's everyone's sure. sensory memory is different and what's stored there is different. Sometimes mm -hmm. people will smell or taste something and it takes them to a memory that's connected to whatever scent that they're coming up with that's in that glass and mm -hmm. to always remember that and sometimes when i say that to people they're like what i'm like yes yeah. your yeah. first thought is your correct thought of what's there trust it yes but I'm not a wine expert. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. 
These are yeah. all your sensory memories. Go with it. Exactly. I remember my first wine class, we were tasting a Riesling and someone, one of the students said, oh, it reminds me of the Dallas airport. And she was getting the petrol off the wine. So, you know, it made sense for her. And it was, yeah. it was, it was correct as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, do you, uh, what's the sort of weirdest wine and food pairing you've ever tried? Oh, weirdest. <laughs> hmm. well, one that you thought wouldn't work, but it actually did, perhaps. There's an exercise that Chef and I were doing, and, I, and I'll call it an exercise because it was a dish, and it's still one of my favorite pairings now, and it was um, roasted, it was sous vide and roasted monkfish on, um, sitting on top of a leek um, potato gratin. And on the bottom of the plate, the sauce was a port red wine sauce, which mm. people were just like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> Fish and red and, wine. Yeah. red wine. Yeah. And it was absolutely stunning. <laughs> and then we went up the scale of wines to taste to just get it just right. Pinot Noir, no matter where we pulled it from, California, um, Russian River, um, even warmer vintages that were just full and rich and riper didn't mm -hmm. work. They kind of fell into the dish. Um, mm -hmm. Cabernet Sauvignon, mountain fruit, it was good, but didn't quite knock it out of the park. And then I said, you know what, there are some herb notes and there's that kind of licorice that's coming through um, from the fennel and that crunch and snap. Hold on. And I ran to the cellar and pulled out um, Skip Stone's Fault Line, a Cap Franc. Uh, coming from Sonoma Mountain, it was okay. perfect. It was absolutely oh, wow. perfect. Um, it had enough fruit and enough body, and the fruits were more um, mulberry, boysenberry, um, and just fresh blackberry that were kind of unripened mm -hmm. uh, fruits. Mm -hmm. And little slivers of bittersweet chocolate and crema. And it absolutely worked because there was structure and tannin and acidity. And it cut through the richness of the gratin. It cut through the richness of the fish. And it cut through the richness of the sauce. And it was just, it was glorious. Oh, yeah, goodness. it really, what really an interesting was. Interesting pairing. Yeah. Um, wow. Very unusual because you would never expect to to pair red wine, particularly with monkfish. Even though monkfish is meaty, but it's also um, the poor man's lobster, as we call it, mm -hmm. um, because it's got that sweetness um, as well. But it was absolutely perfect. And wow. that's, that's, that's the weird one. <laughs> that's inspired. That's great. Good that yeah. you knew, like, to, yeah. what to pull. Um, um, do you have a favorite uh, wine book? I'm sure you've read so many, but oh, does wow. one stand out? The one that I keep coming back to more and more, um, and as a reference and from early on, was Karen McNeil's The Wine Bible. The Wine Bible, um, classic, and yes. I'm super excited to dive into this new edition um, mm -hmm. because it's expanded and it talks about, you know, regions that, you know, I'm really excited about um, Israel, um, Greece, um, all of these regions that have come into the fold of being grape growing regions that have been there for 
millennia, right? But we don't know a lot about them. And the wines are just spectacular. I love Israeli wine. I do. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. And wines from Lebanon as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they all tell a story. All wine tells a story, but there are those that are just evocative and ancient. And those are, those are that. That gives Um, me shivers, just the way you describe it. (laughs) Well, Tonya, this has been amazing. I I loved our conversation. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? We were talking about favorite tools. Oh, yes, please. Coravin. Okay. Coravin, yes to preserve open wine or to actually extract wine from. Yeah. So when, and it's just, it's pretty amazing that Mm -hmm. this little gadget holds some, a canister, small canister of argon. And when you put it on top of, which is how I got extracted the wine out this morning to put in my glass. um, And it's ever so. That's great. A good demo and I, here. And I, and I tell people, if you ever want to taste something from your cellar, but you don't want to open the whole bottle, mm-hmm. this is fantastic. Yeah. You know, during uh, the pandemic, my mom likes wine, but she's very mm-hmm. particular. It's my fault okay. early on. <laughs> um, she loves white burgundy. And so... Mm. I tend not to open those all the time and I save them so that we can have them uh, together. Mm -hmm. But if I wanted a little bit, I could use this. Or if I wanted to pull something older out of the cellar and because it was just me, particularly with the reds, she knew she wasn't going to have any, I would use this and I would just taste wine and have a little bit and put it aside for, you know, a couple of months and then come back to it because I was savoring it, the wine. Yeah. So Lovely. if you don't want to open a bottle, that is the gadget for you. But you would wow. like to taste the wines. Absolutely. But also if you want to see how your cellar's doing, what you have in your cellar, right. that's, that's true. also. Yeah, because yeah. maybe a wine is not ready for drinking and you haven't gone all in and pulled the cork you've just tested and you know that needs to wait a bit longer yeah or yeah. you need to go ahead and drink it and i tell yes. people don't wine waits for no one no. open your wine and drink it <laughs> exactly that's more usually the case isn't it oh my goodness no. yeah oh tonya this is wonderful where can we find you online um i am on facebook uh tonya okay. pitts and i am on um twitter as Tonya Pitts Noir uh, Smollier, and also on Instagram as Noir Smollier. Um, when you put it in, it'll come up as Dame Dame Tonya Pitts, um, because that is Didn't what I go. Yeah, yes? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. Bye. That's great. There. Well, so. we will link to all of those, all of your socials in the show notes so that people can find you. Of course, people should visit you at One Market Restaurant in San Francisco. Be quite Absolutely. an experience. Absolutely. Yes. And congratulations on your recent win. Being named Sommelier of the Year by Wine Spectator, or sorry, Wine Enthusiast Magazine yeah. is, is quite the honor. So congratulations. Well it's deserved. Pr- pretty surreal. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, pretty <laughs> but surreal. so deserved. You've had such an illustrious yeah. career. Um, so I raise my glass to you, Tonya. Cheers. And I hope we can chat again sometime. Thank you. I appreciate you, Natalie. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye for now. Bye for now. Cheers. Cheers.